We just have heard it in the passage we've read. The Son of Man promised to come again riding on the clouds. When Jesus came from the Father, he came to fulfill all that was written about him. He is who he says he is. And he is all that the scriptures say about him. He said this to the two that he met on the road walking to Emmaus. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third days rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. The fulfillment of all that is written about him is just as true for the things yet to be fulfilled as it was for those who have already happened. He will do all that he has promised to do. The scriptures have just as much to say about his second coming, if not more, than what they have already said about the first. The, one of the primary passages about the Son of Man's second coming is what we've read this morning, John, uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 23 through 35. Again, it says, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will arise and perform many signs and wonders and say so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Many come claiming to be a prophet and that they have heard the word from God. Many come claiming they have new scripture. Do not believe it. Do not believe it. He says, see, I have told you beforehand so that you, if they say to you, look, he is here in the wilderness, or he, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather together. If you've ever been outside on a very dark night, possibly like the one that just passed, it was a new moon, or it's very dark, and you see the, in the far distance the clouds, thunder clouds, so far away you can't hear them. Hear but there's lightning. And this, suddenly this lightning strikes, lights up the sky from the east to the west in a single flash of bright light. So it will be when Jesus appear, again returns to the earth. He said the coming of the Son of Man will be like this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear the, in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, because they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. A great gathering of all those who have believed in him, his elect. Paul describes this event in his, the following words in 1 Thessalonians, 
Very, very similar description. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the arch voice of the archangel with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are left, who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we shall always be with the Lord. At his coming, all the tribes of the earth will see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. They will see his coming on the, in glory on the clouds of heaven. Blinding light of, of a, like a flash of lightning. And he will be seen. I can imagine the glory of the Lord with the, uh, innumerable angels following behind him. In verse 32, he continues speaking about knowing that his coming is near. He says, learn from the lesson of the fig tree. As soon as the branch becomes tender and puts out leaves, you know it's summer is near. So when you see the things, you know that he is very near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. They will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he said it would. So what did he mean when he said, when you see these things? His coming is near. It is like when the leaves come out on the trees in the orchard and the buds swell. And we know the spring and the summer is just around the corner. It will be the same when we see the great tribulation and the sun darkened and the moon not shining and the shooting stars and, and streaking across the sky and the darkness falling from the sky. And then we will know his coming is soon. But when he spoke of knowing when this time would come on the world, he said, no one knows that day or hour. Matthew, again, Matthew chapter 24, 30, verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. And then he continues and says, As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Consider the days of Noah. The warnings were there. Noah was building the ark. But then suddenly it began to rain. For as in the days of, of before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field and one will be taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know what, at what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in, it, in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore... You also must be ready for the Son of Man. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. 
This seems to indicate that in the time leading up to the cosmic signs in the heavens, people were going about life as usual, not suspecting anything terrible was coming upon the earth. This sudden, unexpected nature of his coming is so much a part of the times that he warns his servants that they must always be ready and not fall asleep. When it says fall asleep, he's talking about uh, get so busy with life in the world that they forget about looking for him, that they first stop serving him, start living for the world and for pleasure, and falling asleep spiritually. In verse 45, 51, he warns, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master will set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master's delayed, and he begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, and the master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and in an hour that he does not know, and he will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites in the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. When Jesus was taken before the high court of the Jews, the Sanhedrin. He spoke to them about the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven when he gave his confession to the Sanhedrin of being the Son of God, the Son of Man. He told them he will soon be seated at the right hand of the Father with all power and he will return riding on the clouds of heaven. Again, in Matthew 26, 57. Matthew 26, verse 57. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered, and Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. Going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end, now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. Then at last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us, are you the Christ? If you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him in his great confession before them, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He's uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? In Acts 1, 6 to 11, at the time of his ascension into heaven, the angels revealed to the disciples standing there the manner of his return. So when they had all come together and they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, he went, as he went, behold, two men stood beside them in white robes. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you from heaven into heaven, will come again in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He will return, coming, riding on the clouds, the clouds of heaven in great glory and power. So if I were to make some summary points, main points of what we've just read and studied, we might say something like this. He's come he, here um, about his second coming. He will come again just as he said that he would. No word will be left unfulfilled. He will come when he is not expected, like a thief in the night. People will not be ready and looking for him. Destruction will come suddenly, like in the days of Noah. They'll be going about their business as usual. His servants are told to be ready, waiting, and watchful. He will be seen by all the tribes of the earth. And after the tribulation of those days, the sign of the Son of Man will be seen in the heavens. I know when we think about these things, there's been a lot of books written and sermons preached. And we often ask a couple questions in our mind, depending on what your background is and what teaching you've received in the past. One question might be, are there two phases to his coming? Another might be, will his coming be pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation? The theologians write the books on these things. Many dispensationalists believe that his coming will be in two phases. The first phase has been called the rapture. The second phase, they believe, will come at the end of the tribulation. But we're reminded that concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, nor, but only the Father knows. Here are some points that might support a, a two-phase coming. That's the First phase in the rapture of the church and the second phase at the end of the tribulation when all of us are gathered together with the Lord in the air and the coming on the clouds of heaven. I took the, these uh, points from Moody Bible Handbook on theology, which gives support to the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture. So here's my, my points taken from there. Point number one, the nature of the tribulation. The tribulation is an outpouring of God's wrath and punishment on the unrepentant earth after unbelievers have been persecuted, have they been persecuting the church. The believers then who were not killed, will be removed while God punishes the wicked. Some verses to support this idea. Revelation 16.1 says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. These come from verses that you see on your screen. 
Revelation 14, 7, 15, 4, 16, 5 to 7, 19, 2. They all say God's punishment is on the wicked. A second point that might support a two-phase coming of our Lord. The, the scope of the tribulation is global. Only those marked in Israel on their foreheads and hands will be spared of the suffering at that time. In those passages in the book of Revelation, there is no mention of the church. Only Israel and, and the 144,000 and the unsaved, unrepentant people in the world. A third point, the tribulation is a judgment on the people of the earth for their sins. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The judgment is on the people of the earth for their sins. A point number four, the church is saved from the wrath of God. Ephesians 5, 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Romans 5, 9, since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. The church is saved by the by God, from the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, But we ought always to give thanks to God, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And point number five, in the vision of Babylon, in the book of Revelation, God's people are called out of her so that they do not share in her sins and punishment. Revelation verse seven, chapter 17, verse six, the vision of the great prostitute, Babylon the great, the city of great idolatry and economic oppression, says this, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of martyrs of Jesus. They called, the saints are called out from her unless they share in her punishment. And chapter 18 in the book of Revelation 4, verse 4 through 6, then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out from her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her, for her sins are heaped high as the heavens, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others. Repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she has mixed. My sixth point of support for this is that the gathering of those from every tribe, tongue, and nation appear in heaven. Right after it talks about the judgment on Babylon. Revelation 19, 1 to 5. After this I heard and what seemed to be a loud voice of the great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Salvation and glory belong to our God, for his judgments are just and true, and for he has judged the great prostitute and who corrupted the earth with his, her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came 
a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, great and small. The seventh point, the marriage supper of the Lamb appears to happen in heaven. In Revelation 19, 6 to 10. Then I heard what seemed to be a great voice, great voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of peal, mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And it was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen and bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the, are the true words of God. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what can we say in summary and conclusion? The key elements of Christ's second coming are, are these. We can go to slide, this last, the slides here, okay. The sign of his coming will appear suddenly, like a flash of lightning, when he comes riding on the clouds of heaven. The world is called to repent, but they refuse to listen. Only those who put their faith in Jesus, who remain faithful to the end, stay awake, will, keep, will be taken to join the multitude in heaven at the great wedding feast of the Lamb. The judgment begins with the persecution of the church, and then it comes upon the world for their great sins. He is coming again and bringing great wrath upon the wicked in judgment of this world. Let's pray.